Essentially, if you struggle with accountability, maybe if it's been a while since you've been out of school, um, or if it's been a while since you've been in school, then this might be a good option for you. Dorothy, back for our final episode of not the MCAT podcast, uh, but the final episode of Full Length One. We've been breaking down for the last many months and and, uh, a couple months with you because you've done a lot of these with me. (laughs) Um, But many, many, many months of breaking down Blueprint MCAT full length one, which everyone gets for free at blueprintmcat.com. But we are in our last three questions, finishing out with our discrete section here on Psychsos on full length one. So bittersweet come to an end. At this point in the day, the student is is shaking a little bit. They're a little bit hypo, hypoglycemic. Yeah. <laughs> their, their legs are cramping. The blood's a little bit uh, uh, stopped flowing because because they're not squeezing their butt enough to get the blood moving. <laughs> oh, um, but but it, it's the end. We're here. Yeah. I remember walking out of my exam feeling like a truck had hit me. Um, <laughs> I was so like almost physically exhausted just from sitting in a chair and trying to use my brain for the last eight hours. So yeah. it's definitely, definitely a marathon. I would love to see, and I don't know if this is a possibility at some point in the future, I would love to see Prometric centers and, and Pearson test centers mm-hmm. um, start to use um adjustable desks so like oh, yeah. for one section you could be standing for another section you can sit like that would be amazing uh yeah for and if sure. the blueprint if, if if the blueprint if the mcat were offered online so you wouldn't have to go take it at a test center like you could do that at your home uh mm-hmm. but hey what what do i know <laughs> <sighs> all right one day maybe <laughs> one, one day maybe uh after i'm dead all right, so let's go ahead and jump into um, our last set of, of questions here. Uh, so we're into discretes, no more passages, uh, and this first one looks like a doozy. So question 57, what best describes the relationship between attribution theory and fundamental attribution error? No idea. All right, A, attribution theory states that a, Attribute phenotypes are associated with inner psychological functioning. Fundamental attribution error refers to a misdiagnosis of physiological state based on over-reliance on an attribute phenotype. That's a mouthful. B, attribution theory relates to an attempt by an individual to interpret actions by assigning causes to them. Fundamental attribution error is when an individual interprets another's actions incorrectly by overemphasizing external events instead of internal characteristics. C, attribution theory relates to an attempt by an, invi- by an individual to interpret actions by assigning causes to them. Fundamental attribution error is when an individual interprets another's actions incorrectly by overemphasizing internal characteristics instead of external events. D, attribution theory states that attribute genotypes are associated with inner psychological functioning. Fundamental attribution errors refer to a misdiagnosis of psychological state based on over-reliance on an attribute genotype. And at this point, I would give up, choose answer choice C, and move on because I have no, uh, no patience left to actually figure out what all of those are saying and try to compare each of them. Yeah. Fair. So <laughs> this is one of those, like, either you know it or you don't. If you don't know it, it can be kind of a headache to try and parse through it, especially with these super long, intimidating answer choices. And you have two more questions left in this set. So especially if you're down to the wire, you might as well spend more time trying to get those points. Um, all right. So attribution theory. So attribution, by definition, is kind of like explain, right? So an attribution theory kind of attempts to explain um the causes of behavior or events. So it's kind of an umbrella term for different models that kind of attempt to understand the ways in which we attribute events of behavior to things. So um, fundamental attribution error is a type of attribution theory um, where it's essentially talking about how people will overemphasize internal factors 
as explanations for the behavior of other people. So it's essentially like, if I have a great day or if I do well on a test, it's because I'm super smart. Um, but if someone else doesn't do, um, or sorry, it's because I worked hard, maybe I'm super smart. But if someone else does great on a test, it's because, you know, maybe that maybe they were smart, but it's more often used for negative things. So if they did bad on a test, it I'm not going to care if their grandma died the day before. I'm just going to say, oh, they're not smart. They're, they, they couldn't have done well even if they tried, right? It's just this tendency for us to assume that when people, other people do things badly and when things go badly for them, it's because of a dispositional thing rather than a situational thing. But when I do badly on a test, I'm like, oh, I my pet died or I couldn't get out of bed this morning, whatever it is that so I'm looking more at my own situational factors because I actually know my situational factors. I don't mm. know them as well for other people. So I'm going to not, I'm going to ignore that piece and think that it's more dispositional on their part. Mm. Um, and so attribution theory deals a lot with like dispositional versus situational. So um, the other part that I started out saying is like, good things for me happen because I work hard or I'm smart or something like that for other people. I might interpret it differently depending on whether it's a good or bad event. <sighs> okay. Do we want to go through together or do you want to try and parse through? <laughs> How are you feeling? <laughs> you just do what you want to do. Cause my, my brain hurts at, at just reading these. Um, All right. <laughs> Um, let's look at A and D first, because they look almost identical. The only difference is that we have attribute phenotypes and attribute genotypes in A and D, respectively. And so attribution theory, as I mentioned, is really just explaining, like, why do people, how do people explain certain consequences and, like, events that happen? So nothing to do with phenotype or genotype. That's really irrelevant. So I'm going to get rid of A and D. B and C, so they also look kind of related. So I'm going to see in, if I can figure out where they diverge. So the first part is the same. So attribution theory relates to an attempt by an individual to interpret actions by assigning causes to them. Fundamental attribution error, so looking at B, is when an individual interprets another's actions incorrectly by overemphasizing external events instead of internal characteristics. So it's really in those last couple of words that the distinction is created between B and C, right? Mm. So fundamental attribution error is again, I overemphasize um, internal things for other people. I'm saying, oh, they did bad on that test because they're not smart rather than whatever might have been going on in their external surroundings um, rather than the opposite. So C is the correct answer here. So your lucky guess would have been correct. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's all that matters. <laughs> oh man, lucky guess. That's called skill. All right. Question 58. Go ahead. All right. So a study participant was asked to observe circular images and determine if they were the same size as a 10 centimeter squared circle. Circles with areas greater than or equal to 11 centimeters squared were perceived as different. Circles with areas between 10.1 and 10.9 centimeters squares were perceived as the same size as the 10 centimeter squared circle. If the participant was then was asked to compare samples with a circle with an area of 200 centimeters squared, Weber's law would predict that a circle of what area would be perceived as being of the same size. So we're dealing with Weber's law here. Hmm. <laughs> Whoever Weber is. I just wish I was old and, and had like much older and had things named after me. That would be really cool. Um, <laughs> I mean, you do have things named after you. Yeah. An anatomy yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, we're comparing circles. Circles between 10.1 and 10.9 were perceived as the same, although greater than or equal to 11 uh, or bigger. If the participant mm -hmm. was then asked to compare samples with a circle with an area of 200 centimeters, Weber's law would predict that a circle of what area would be perceived as being of the same size. Interesting. So, hmm. So we're, we're dealing with something much, much bigger, right? Mm -hmm. and 
We want to know same size. I, I don't know what Weber's law has to do with anything here. Cause mm. it seems like they're telling us, Hey, 10 is, um, 10 is, oh, I don't know, 10.1 and 10.9. Like if we, if we just multiplied by 10, so you'd have 100, 101 mm -hmm. to 109. So 200 would just be, oh, I don't know. Do you just double that? Like yeah. it, would, it would have to be close to 218 to 220. So 218 would be n nine doubled, right? So I would go with answer choice C, 218. Yeah, C would be correct. So Weber's <sighs> law, you could definitely get here without knowing the actual law if you can just use proportions. But Weber's law is literally just saying that there is a constant, they call it a just noticeable difference. So it's a JND, a just noticeable difference across the full range of stimuli. So essentially, if you have, in this case, you have a one to 9% increase from that 10 centimeters squared that you can't notice. But once you hit that 10% increase, you can notice a difference. So that is like your threshold, your just noticeable difference there at 10%. So in this case, you're just looking for a proportional amount. 200 plus 9% 9 of 200 is 218. Yeah. Yeah. It's, awesome. it's, it's just my, my, my <laughs> again, this is what's going to happen on the real test day where your brain is just tired and you don't want to think anymore. And so I'm getting to this going, what does Weber's law have to do with anything? Because you just told me what the numbers were. Why do I need to know some law to predict <laughs> blah, blah, blah. It's just simple math. So right. <sighs> anyway, there we go. All right. Last question, Ryan. <laughs> last question. I will get there. I will get there. All right. Question 59. <laughs> a private school sets up a system by which students may advance to the next grade solely based solely on the basis of their individual performance on an exam. Given the wide variety of talents each student has, some students are able to advance to the next grade months or even years before other students. This system is a, quote, meritocracy, quote, <laughs> did I say quote, <laughs> is A, a meritocracy, B, an oligarchy, C, guaranteed to generate student failure, or D, an example of spatial discrimination. Whoo. So meritocracy, like, stands out a bunch, right? Because it's all based on mm -hmm. merit, but... Yeah. Is it true merit? I don't know, but it seems like it is. So I'm just going to go with meritocracy because, again, my brain hurts at this point. Meritocracy is great. Yeah, that works. So meritocracy is just, you know, people are rewarded on the basis of their skill or talent or achievement so or hard work. So in this case, if they are testing out, essentially, then that's merit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. What What is the, the, next, um, the next most picked one i would assume d is it's c and d yeah, yeah. they're kind of tied at six percent each okay um so c guaranteed to generate student failure guaranteed is kind of a, an extreme word yeah um so you might not approve the system and you might think it could generate student failure but guaranteed maybe not um to that extent and then D, an example of spatial discrimination, um, that's actually sensation related. So spatial discrimination is like, can you distinguish between two points of contact on one on your skin or something like that? So that's more of a sensation thing than um, anything here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And with that, <laughs> we've made it. Hopefully what this has allowed you to do, the student, uh, is to go take Blueprint Full Length 1, Blueprint MCAT Full Length 1. You get it for free, blueprintmcat.com. Just sign up for a free account. You get access to the system. Go take the test. And then as part of your review, you're going through the questions with us and learning kind of right and wrong and thought process and everything else to help you improve on getting a higher score. So that's, that's what I got. And uh, Dorothy, again, for for you, you are a Blueprint MCAT Live Online instructor. Talk about what the Live Online course is for students who may be interested. Yeah, so we have a 10-week and a 16-week program. And essentially, if you struggle with accountability, maybe if it's been a while since you've been out of school, um, or if it's been a while since you've been in school, then this might be a good option for you. Um, essentially, you meet every week or maybe even twice a week with two instructors 
um, like me, like myself, who will um, walk us through strategy and practice questions and applied content. So you'll kind of do your content review during the week and then come to class for strategy and how to apply that content to actual test site questions. So it's a very practical way to um, learn how to study for the MCAT, um, I think in a way that is hopefully helpful with direct feedback every week. All right, there you have it. Everything at blueprintmcat.com. Dorothy, thanks for hanging out with us again. And hopefully this has been super helpful for students. Yeah, all right. Thanks for having me, Ryan. It's been really fun. And um, best of luck out there for anyone who is pre-med, studying for the MCAT, whatever, wherever you are on your journey. I believe in you. 